I have a a manuscript here. This was turned in by Reverend Teeters LaVerge of uh, the Church of the Subgenius. Uh, he's been, uh, I'm, well, I'll just read it. The, the, the title is The Agent and Mr. Dobbs. And um, actually the manuscript is from October 1962. But these papers were found on the body of a transient party clown in the city of Albany, New York in 1989. The papers had been meticulously taped back together after an apparent attempt at shredding them. Some pages are missing. The party clown was determined by the county coroner to have been killed by, a f by being force-fed copious amounts of silly putty, uh, some of which still had a cartoon imprint of a pleasant yet disturbing face of a smiling man with a pipe clenched between his teeth. Now, here's the uh, manuscript. As I said, this is from 1962, so you'll have to forgive some of the dated terminology used by the agent who uh, wrote this. I'm skipping over a part where he, he was dropped off at the Dobbs house or mansion. The knocker on the huge oaken front door was a rather heavy, rusty iron piece in the shape of a dollar sign. I banged it down thrice and awaited an answer. Soon the door creaked open and in front of me stood the tallest colored man I have ever seen, even taller than Agent 541. However, he had a very high squeaky voice that resembles a certain cartoon mouse. He asked me my business, and I replied that I had an urgent appointment with Mr. Dobbs. The uh, man answering the door seemed fairly out of it, too, and replied back that the sky was pretty damn blue today. Again, I had to wait a few minutes until he asked me my business, but before I could answer, he was ushering me into the cavernous building. Once inside, I noticed that it was rather well appointed with both new and antique furnishings, which to my eyes seemed to come from all corners of the earth and were set about in no discernible pattern. There were piles of paper and stacks of money everywhere. What caught my eye, though, was the incredible amount of junk laying about the place. This Mr. Dobbs, it would seem, had a habit of collecting useless objects found by the side of the road. Finally, after walking through many hallways, I was shown to a door and told to walk in, that I was expected. I did as told. The room I entered was the most sane that I had so far seen, a, a typical den that any well-cultured man may have in his home. Mr. Dobbs was sitting in a large leather armchair with his back to me, a billow of smoke coming up from his front. I slowly walked over to him. He said nothing, but with his right hand, he motioned me to sit on a folding metal chair adjacent to him. He seemed to be engrossed in a television program. It was Leave it to Beaver, a wholesome program. Suddenly, he began to speak. I do love this show. That Ward Cleaver is one relaxed man. Connie doesn't like me to watch this program. She thinks it's pornographic, but that's why I like it. He fell into a deep silence, intently watching a commercial and nodding his head in time with the jingle. When the commercial ended, he turned to me and asked, What can I do for you, young agent? I noticed then that even though the upper half of his body was clad in a dark suit with white shirt and dark tie, the bottom half of his body was clad only in wingtip shoes. It was very disturbing and put me off for a moment, but I'd been warned by my handlers that this Mr. Dobbs had many tricks up his sleeve, and I took this as his way of making a person uncomfortable. I regained my composure and told him, Mr. Dobbs, the agency I work for has a request for you, when suddenly Mr. Dobbs got up out of his chair and walked over to a well-appointed wet bar and poured a tumbler full of what he claimed was the finest scotch saying it was from Malaysia or Canada or somewhere. Uh, my memory begins to get hazy here. It, it was not scotch at all. It smelled like grape, but tasted for the life of me like gasoline. 
He bade me to drink. Uh, knowing that he's an important partner, I tried to force down a sip. Then Mr. Dobbs did the strangest thing. He started to do what I believe is called a hula dance, yet he was humming some tango to himself. Even though I was warned about his eccentric behavior, I, I can't abide a half-naked man dancing in front of me. Yet I was transfixed. I know now that I must have been drugged. He danced for a while, too close to me for my waning comfort. My heart beat faster, and the rank smoke from his pipe seemed to make my head swim and my vision fade. I thought I was about to faint when my heart nearly burst as I felt a pair of hands starting to massage my shoulders. I looked up to see a beautiful blonde with a perfect perm smiling down on me. I took this to be his wife, Connie. She said, don't fret, Bob likes to dance on Fridays. She continued, now, now, dearie, we mustn't mess with our company. Mr. Dobbs ignored her and continued his lewd dance. Connie bade me to ask Bob what questions I may need to ask him. I started out by getting straight to the point, reminding him of the troubles with Cuba. Mr. Dobbs then did the queerest thing I'd seen him do yet. He ran over to a big wooden box on the bar, opened it, and pulled out a huge novelty cigar. He then proceeded to insert said huge novelty cigar up his uh, uh, neither port. The cigar spontaneously ignited, and Mr. Dobbs blew smoke rings out of his ears. Surely this was an illusion or a hallucination from my drugged st state. I found myself mesmerized by Mr. Dobbs' antics, uh, Connie's back rub, and the scotch I found myself taking a liking to. Uh, Connie's hands reached down to my uh, lap as I watched Mr. Dobbs preach about economics and Cuba and war and how it all tied together, all the while bent over with a huge cigar puffing away in his <clears throat> nether port. And that is the last I remember of that evening. The ensuing lie detector tests and truth serums have borne that out. I awoke the next morning, late, I believe, with a cool breeze fluttering through pastel pink curtains. I had the worst hangover I'd ever experienced. I cannot fully describe the sensation. It was somewhere between getting a root canal and the high of three martinis. I was startled to notice that Connie Dobbs was nude lying next to me. I tried getting up, but soon regretted it by the dizziness it caused, and worst of all, I saw what was laying next to Connie. All I saw was its shoulders and a cheap bouffant wig on its head. Its skin was gray. I don't mean sickly human gray, I mean gray as gray can be. Its body shape was all out of whack too. Then I had fleeting memories of a wild sexual encounter with Mrs. Dobbs and something else. I remember having intercourse with orifices that were not human. I must have shuddered, for Connie rolled over and picked up a glass of some clear liquid off the nightstand and two tablets. She demanded I take them, for they would make me feel better. I inspected the tablets, and though they resembled your basic aspirin, they were had embossed on them the word pills, spelled P-I-L-S. Afraid of being drugged again, I tried to hide them in my cheek, but when I drank the liquid, they just slid down my throat. Within minutes, reality started to fade, and some sort of orgy began. Uh, the last thing I remember was Mr. Dobbs, dressed as a clown with no pants on, of course, attempting to take my virginity. I still have nightmares about this, but as they say, my country, right or wrong. Weeks passed that I have little memory of. I know this only because of the date in which I was retrieved by the agency. The Dobbses and their minions kept me pretty well fropped up, as they called it. The next event that I have any clear memory of was of taking a ridiculously long elevator ride deep into the earth at the Bobco Mining and Soylent Green Consortium in Wyoming. We must have been on that elevator for three hours. One of Dobbs' minions took my watch during the orgy and refused to give it back, saying Bob doesn't pay enough and he had to get some stuff for a weekend party he and the Kennedys were having with one Dr. Oswald. 
When we finally alighted from the elevator, to my surprise, we were not in some mine shaft as I expected, but in a huge vaulted warehouse full of novelty goods that were being stacked and sorted by strange short <laughs> men shrouded in sack rags. Bob claimed that they were ex-Nazi scientists working on some, quote, super-duper extra-secret, unquote, project for the government. I could clearly see that they were not men at all, but slaves of some unknown species. By this time, I had found it to my better judgment not to doubt Mr. Dobbs, at least not out loud. We took a golf cart type of vehicle down a long winding corridor. Mr. Dobbs not once paid any attention to where he was driving. He decided to, at that time, ramble on and on about some mysterious substance he called slack, all the while puffing insanely on his pipe, the bowl of which soon glowed a bright red. During this journey, we ran over three of Bob's slave men and nearly hit countless others. Mr. Dobbs was oblivious to each, quote, accident. I put that in quotes for each one of the slaves we ran over, I happened to notice had been pointing a weapon of some sort at Mr. Dobbs right before he mindlessly ran over them. This mysterious Mr. Dobbs may have some sort of second sight or is just incredibly lucky. As you'll see, I believe it has more to do with luck and some sort of strange time control powers than with anything else. Mr. Dobbs' underground office was a horror. I can barely describe it. It was a total mess and stank of the tobacco that he constantly smoked. In fact, I never saw Mr. Dobbs without that infernal pipe clenched between his teeth. It was only after a few minutes of adjusting to the stench and the mess of the office that I saw something that horrified me. The place had several severed human heads strewn haphazardly all over. Now, I've seen some terrible sights in my life, and I suspect that if I'm on the Dobbs case, I will see worse. But what made me gasp was that the heads were not of random humans, but of public figures that we would all recognize. I saw the heads of, and this section was carefully cut out of the original report, and one was actually singing. It begged me in a tenor to please kill me. Surprisingly, in the state I had been in, I did not faint. Instead, with all the smoke from Bob's special tobacco mix, I started to laugh. This got Bob all worked up. He started to jump around inanely and laugh. He then proceeded to use one of the heads, not the singing one, in a most foul manner. Bob bade me sit down on a chair that was stacked high with papers. I looked at the stack and back at Bob, wondering what he expected me to do. By this time, I'd begun to get in the spirit of the situation and laughingly knocked the stack of papers on the floor. Mr. Dobbs didn't seem to mind. In fact, he stared down at the mess I met and said thanks, picked up a sheet of paper saying he'd been looking for this contract for quite some time. The glyphs on the sheet were of no known human alphabet that I have ever encountered. For some reason, this worried me and reminded me of the slaves I saw working for Bob and that dreadful night with Mrs. Dobbs and that strange gray creature. I did not have much time to consider the implications, for Mr. Dobbs wadded up the paper, tossed it in a corner, and told me to follow him. This time, we did not take the vehicle, but instead walked down dark and dank corridors which had a gradual downslope. Being without a timepiece, I cannot estimate the amount of time we walked but it seemed like hours. Here, I must admit, my perceptions of time had been warped by constant exposure to Bob's tobacco. Mr. Dobbs finally guided me to our final destination. What I saw in that final circle of hell, I cannot, I will not reveal. Through all the pressure that the agency could bear against me, a loyal, true blue agent and American, I found it in our best interest to keep some things secret even from the boss, the man in the dress. I do this for the good of our nation and, and out of fear, for what Mr. Dobbs revealed to me was so horrific, so humorous, so bizarre, so unchristian, so baffling and dangerous that I hyperventilated through the inane laughter that was my only defense lest I totally lose my mind. The last thing I remembered that day was Mr. Dobbs dancing around my prostrate body, he was prancing really, and mimicking my insane laughter with his own even crazier chortles. He spoke no words, 
He just laughed, but his laughter seemed to speak volumes to my inner mind. I laughed, I wept, I urinated in my undergarments, for Mr. Dobbs had somehow relieved me of my slacks, when I do not recall. I awoke, I'm not sure when, on a garbage-strewn beach in some tropical or subtropical location. I recall the sound of ocean waves breaking on the shore and that of a mambo band. I almost choked when I was offered a daiquiri by the dictator F blanked out, C blanked out, we assume uh, Fidel Castro, and I'm just going to say that from now on, uh, who is sitting next to me on the beach towel. I drank the beverage only out of a severe thirst. It was tasty, however. You can't beat good Cuban rum. Sitting on the other side of me was Dr. Oswald, who was removing the cash from my wallet, mumbling about, that damn Bob never pays me on time. I was so overwhelmed that I did nothing to counter his actions. Fidel Castro kept serving me daiquiris, and so in a very short time I found myself intoxicated again. Though my actions may seem un-American, bear in mind that I considered myself still undercover. I eventually extricated myself by saying I needed to urinate in the ocean. While doing my business, I was startled by Mr. Dobbs shooting up out of the water in front of me like a deranged dolphin, his pipe miraculously still smoking. He mentioned that the water was quite a bit warmer here, and if I would not mind if he lingered to warm himself up a bit. I, of course, never told him of the source of warmth. I was startled again by what I initially thought were Mrs. Dobbs, uh, Connie's, hands rubbing the strain out of my back. Bob sat in the water in front of me, smiling, while I felt all the tension being massaged from my shoulders. It was incredibly relaxing, until a slim gray hand popped another Dobbs Co. pill in my mouth and smoothed it down my throat. It was not Mrs. Dobbs, it was that damnable gray creature from that horrible first night at the Dobbs residence. Bob found my confusion and fear amusing. He laughed and jumped up and down in the water, screaming, Bob wants one too! Bob wants one too! Mr. Dobbs received a large handful of pills. Uh, pills, by the way, is spelled p with one L throughout this manuscript. Strangely, the pills seemed to sober him up, unlike in my case, where the hallucinations began in earnest again for I could have sworn I saw Mr. Dobbs soon after absent-mindedly battling a giant shark while lecturing both Fidel Castro and Dr. Oswald on some convoluted concept he called slack. The next event I clearly remember was having martinis in a jet with Mr. and Mrs. Dobbs, the president and his wife, and that abominable gray creature Mr. Dobbs was bemoaning the reliability of Dr. Oswald while the president was assuring him that uh, though he had a tendency to whine about being left out, that all in all he was reliable. Mrs. Dobbs, the president's wife, and the Gray were divining the future from the entrails of a squid. All three seemed deeply concerned. Feeling bold and being sick of the constant drugging that was taking place, I stood up and demanded to know what was really going on. Initially, I was ignored until I tried to grab the pipe out of Mr. Dobbs's mouth. It would not budge. It was like it was part of his bone structure, but it did grab his attention. He looked at me straight in the eye. His constant grin seemed to get bigger and his face dissolved into a mass of tiny, luminescent dots. It was then that I knew he had the power. I backed away in fear and awe until the president beckoned me over, stuttering in his annoying New England accent. It's all right, son. Bob's got things under control. I thought to myself that this buffoon, this magician, this slacker has things under control. But it appears that he did or does. I, I was then quickly sold. I, myself, was sold, like in an auction, by our president to Mr. Dobbs for a stack of styrofoam cups and a game of tic-tac-toe, which Mr. Dobbs declared he had to win, 
and a carefully chosen donut from a squished box that lay at the president's feet. I felt exhausted. I, I felt that I somehow had let down my country, even though I was, in essence, commanded by our president to obey Mr. Dobbs. It pained me to think that I was sold to this man-god beast for some junk. Then I remembered my oath. Then I remembered all the junk laying around Mr. Dobbs' mansion. The severed heads. Oh, I was just part of a bigger plan. I knew then it was my duty to play the game through. Still, my insides burned with shame. For the rest of the flight, I sat brooding. Nothing could bring me out of my funk, not Mr. Dobbs's childish and obvious magic coin tricks. I knew very well he had it in his hand when he pulled the quarter from behind my ear. Neither the President's poor impersonations of cartoon characters could pull me from my funk. It was only the pills that got me in the swing of things, and that was a shame to me in and of itself. The Dobbses, the Grays and I, were dropped off in Miami Beach, where the Dobbses had a residence, while the President mentioned that he had to go to some secret base in New Mexico until things, quote, cooled down a bit, unquote. The Dobbs residence was not at all like their mansion. It was small and neat. I was ushered into the bathroom and told to take a shower, for according to Bob, I smelled like, quote, the older ones on a binge. Uh, the shower immediately sobered me up, and I found that I was famished. Dinner, however, was a disappointment. It was cold rice with a bit of rat meat. Bob said he had learned this hangover remedy from one Uncle Ho, and that I'd better get used to it. It was disgusting. I, I feigned eating, hiding the half-chewed scraps in my napkin. Bob did not eat, but puffed away on his pipe. Connie, however, ate with gusto. After dinner, I insisted that we go to this tiki lounge I knew of uh, nearby for ham and pineapple. I told him it was on me, though I had no cash after Dr. Oswald's thievery. This excited Bob to such a degree that he jumped up on the table and started to do his Friday night dance again. It took Connie some time to quiet him down. Bob decided that we would walk while Connie would take their pedicab. I had never seen a pedicab service here in our great nation although I was beginning to be immune to the insanity that permeated my experience around the Dobbses. I actually vomited a little in my mouth when I saw the creature that was pulling the pedicab. It was A, and here it's blanked out again, A-H, blanked out. His mustache was shaved, but it was him. I could see the stitch mark scars around the top of his head where his brain had been reinserted. I was always led to believe that the Soviets burned his body, but sold his brain to us in exchange for the secret that uh, those folks we found in our blanked out New Mexico sold us in exchange for the bodies of their comrades. What a revelation! As is known, I lost my big brother to the Germans in the big one, so every cell in my body wanted to strangle that terrible thing standing by the curb. But seeing him dressed in a tutu with rabbit ears on his head, I was moved to pity. It was quite obvious that he was near brain dead at this point. He could also, I might add, haul that pedicab pretty damn fast in those six-inch stiletto heels. Further down the sidewalk on that moonlit, humid night, I had to finally admit to Bob that Dr. Oswald had stolen all my money. Bob snickered and nodded knowingly, saying, <laughs> He is a little worm, but I've got plans for him. I was pondering this potentially dangerous comment when Bob suddenly stopped and bent down to tie his shoe. I then walked to the front when a brick from nowhere hit me square in the head. Thank God for the steel plate I had placed there after the <clears throat> accident. For if Bob had not stopped to tie his shoe, I'm sure that he would have been brained. Although now I wonder if he could ever be hurt. He has the most persistent luck of any man I've known. 
When Bob had finished tying his shoe, ignoring my yelps of pain and the violent flow of blood flowing down my face, he came back up with a wallet. Miraculously, he said that he knew this man, the owner of the wallet, one Dr. Tim Leary. It would seem that they were old friends. Bob mumbled to himself that the SOB owed him as he proceeded to take all the cash from the wallet, a sandal warehouse charge card, and a folded slightly blue tinted piece of paper that was perforated into many small squares. This object Bob seemed most excited about for he shoved it into his mouth and mumbled something like, let him try to read my mind again. He then started to chuckle. He chuckled until we walked into the Tiki Lounge. At least we had over a hundred dollars in cash that Bob now had. Connie was already seated at a table with two cabana boys dancing for her. Bob took me by the arm and led me up to the bar where, filling one hand with a wad of colorful Monopoly money and the other with a wad of strange smelling sticky tobacco and a chewed up old pipe. He told me to frop up a bit and get something to drink. He glared over at Connie, he hitched up his pants and mumbled that he had to take care of a few things. And damn those boys stole my dance moves. I found myself engrossed in this strange tobacco. It was not as the youth of today call Mary Jane. It had a foul odor and taste, but for some reason I, I found that it not only soothed my spirit, but that the pipe seemed to be stuck in my mouth. I was not clenching my teeth down on the stem, yet I could not extract it. It was as if it glued itself to my mouth. That fact made eating dinner rather difficult. I apparently was oblivious under the influence of this weed when I heard the sounds of breaking glass. I knew it must be Bob. Surely enough, he had pushed all the plates and glasses off the table and was dancing with the boys on the tabletop. Connie looked away, apparently in disgust, as she filed her nails with what looked like the severed hand of a gorilla or some other sort of great ape. Bob then threw a salt shaker, which hit me square in the forehead, causing it to bleed. I must now add that no one had mentioned the fact that my face was already covered in fresh blood or that I was not wearing trousers. Bob had still not given them back to me yet. He yelled to me, Get those damn Mai Tais! I have a powerful thirst! I proffered the Monopoly money to the bartender in my fropped up state. He looked at Bob and back to me, shook his head, and produced a pitcher of the drink. There was fear in his eyes. Is this Bob a member of a criminal group, the criminal group that does not exist? It may have been some strange influence of the frop, but the 20 feet and the few seconds that it took to get to our table seemed more like a mile and an hour. I wonder now if there was not some sort of space-time distortion brought on by the frop, for when I arrived at the table it was neatly set with plates of appetizers, which very much looked and tasted like flambéed monkey brains. Tasty, though. Bob's were raw. Plus, there was a youngish-looking man that was introduced as Timmy Boy. Bob said that he had a uh, big jumbo, big giant colossal plans for him. It was apparently the Dr. Tim Leary whose wallet Bob had just found on the street. I began to wonder if I were being set up, but reviewing the strange luck that Bob seemed to have, I had to admit to myself that Maybe this guy was more than extraordinary. He already had shown that he had at least as much power as the president. Bob did give Dr. Leary back his wallet, but claimed that some young punks jumped us. He pointed convincingly to my bloody head and shirt, stating that my bleeding head was good. I still don't understand what he meant by that. Dr. Leary tore through his wallet in an angry manner. He grabbed Bob by the wrist, stating, not asking, You took the blotter? Bob just stuck out his tongue with the messy, faded, and chewed wad of paper sitting there. His tongue was extraordinarily long and lizard-like. He snapped it back with a grin. Dr. Leary drew his hands back to himself and pouted. 
Dinner went surprisingly well. The conversation was adept and civilized, though the Dobbs seemed to have a language of their own, which Dr. Leary and I could somehow follow. The other two disconcerting issues I remembered was that every time I tried to pour a drink for myself, Bob would knock it out of my hand, stating, Frop before booze, you can't lose. Booze before frop, you'll wish you were dead. The other issue I had was that uh, what I thought was Connie's smooth hand rubbing my knee, uh, she is a knockout, was however, of course, not hers, and no, not the gray either. It was that damned A blanked out, H blanked out, A-H, under the table begging for scraps. I kicked the thing away, but out of mercy did give it the cold monkey brains that I could not finish. This frop has the odd ability to make one hungry, but at the same time make the act of eating very, very strange and uncomfortable. I wanted to chew the food, but was not able to swallow it. Bob, on the other hand, did eat heartily. A half a pig, all of the raw monkey brains, a light bulb, I do not know where he got it, the tropical flower set in the table, and what I fear to think was a human heart, raw. A.H. had to pull us all back to the Dobbs bungalow. I did not pity him at this point. Uh, for the whole trip back, Bob kept looking up at the night skies, pointing out constellations that were not there, muttering, Gort, Klatu, Veranda, Nixon, or something. Whatever was in the monkey brains he ate sure seemed to have relaxed him, for when we got back to the house, uh, the Gray had messed it up while we were out to dinner. Bob seemed pretty peeved, but accepted this situation with grace. Uh, he put on some very strange music on the hi-fi, lounged back into an easy chair, and lectured me. I quote as best as I can remember. Young man, thou hast muchly to unlearn. I sayest thus out of pure spite. Thou hast disunderstood everything I havest revealedest to thouest, which in mine eyes is unre-unnerving, and thou dost screw me over? I replied, Mr. Dobbs, I was sent on a mission that you requested. I have only held back one truth, and that is that you are a wanted man, wanted by our great nation to smite our enemies. I was told that you have the powers to do that. Then why don't you? Bob wriggled around in his chair. I feared another dance session emerging, but he seemed unbob-like nervous. <laughs> Look at you, monkey boy. I just ate the brains of your great-great-great-uncle with a bit of lime juice. Do you want to de re unevolve back into our natural state or evolve into a pile of ashes? I sat staring at his classical face pondering what he had told, not asked me. His face and body began to shimmer, or flicker like a film projector gone haywire. Bob scrunched his face up and let out a fart that literally shook the house. This emission propelled him up into the air to the point of hitting his head on the ceiling. He slowly descended back to the exact spot he had previously been sitting. A change came over him. His eyes had glassed over, and he looked confused, as would an elderly man with dementia. So, he said out of the blue, let's get some hookers. I know of a great place next to Cape Canaveral. Bob drove, if one could even call it driving, for he never once had his hands on the wheel. He appeared to steer with his knees, but mostly with another part of his anatomy that seemed to have a literal mind of its own, at least according to Connie. Uh, Bob never looked out the windshield. The whole time he was behind the wheel, he had his head sticking out the driver's side window, nostrils flared to an incredible degree, and his tongue hanging out like a dog's. I myself had my foot pushed hard on the floor against a non-existent foot brake, and my hands clenched on the door handle. Bob was constantly looking around and up into the night skies. He said he was looking for them, and p-sniffing, actually pronounced it p-sniffing, 
around for the skunk ape, a version, he told me, of the Himalayan Yeti. He said there were lots of them around this part of Florida, that they were friendly, but also that they had glands that contained a powerful aphrodisiac. So either way, if you run into one, you are lucky. It was not long until he slammed on the brakes and we skidded off into a ditch. Bob bounded out of the car and started to run into a swampy area to the west. I followed out of stupidity for the bramble and the vines growing in the swamp cut up my legs bad. I still had no trousers. I should mention that Bob did not actually run. He leaped and bounded more like a gazelle, quite graceful. When I finally caught up with him, he was rolling around in a large patch of trampled down cane that certainly looked like the bedding of a great ape-like creature. The smell was sickening, but it did have a strange allure to it. Bob was in ecstasy as he rolled around in the stinking muck. Must be in heat, he exclaimed as he got up. Uh, oddly, his clothing had not one speck of dirt or mud on it. When I mentioned that, he just giggled and for the first time acknowledged that I was uh, wearing no trousers, saying, we'd have to remedy that. Once we were back in the car, Bob let out a sigh that sounded almost sad. Skunk ape is one hot to trot yeti, he whispered something in a language to himself as he played pocket pool in his pants. Well now, son, off to get you some trousers. We had not driven far, maybe a mile, to the edge of a small run-down town full of white trash, as they say in the South. Bob's nostrils started to flare again as he sniffed about in the air and chuckled to himself. We pulled off onto the side of the road next to a ramshackle house that was more down than up. The incongruity was not lost on me, at least. Bob, dressed to the T with his battleship-sized Cadillac, compared to this hovel we were now at. However, Bob showed no sign of noticing. He simply knocked on the door. Soon, a much degraded man of indeterminate age answered. Bob, without introductions, offered to sell this man a haircut in exchange for the incredibly filthy overalls he was wearing. The degenerate hillbilly agreed to the deal without haggling. In fact, I would say that he seemed ecstatic. He, he seemed to swoon. The haircut Bob gave him was perfect. He even styled it exactly like his own, using hair gel from a tube he had in his jacket pocket, telling the man that, Now, he emphasized, things are going to change for the better. Though I did see Bob absentmindedly place one hand on a rickety wooden shelf and grabbed what looked like a government check while with the other he regally handed the man a five-cent plastic comb, grinning as if he'd just done him a favor. I don't think Mr. Dobbs is a thief, per se, nor a kleptomaniac. He may simply not have control over himself and his desires in the same way that we normal people do. For myself, I'm glad that I did not have a mirror to see myself so shamefully dressed. The standard jacket, tie, white shirt, wingtip shoes and the filthiest, smelliest pair of overalls that could be imagined. Bob took an uncomfortably close whiff of me and nodded his approval. Hmm, now you smell useful. Again, I must emphasize that this man is by nature uncanny and powerful. He is a force to be either feared or harnessed, if that is even possible, and I doubt that it is. I have a gut feeling that we may find it advantageous to adapt ourselves to him. With Bob driving well over 80 miles an hour, we made it to the Cape Canaveral area fast. By this time, I'd given up worrying and decided to follow whatever path Mr. Dobbs might drag me along, for it occurred to me that so far through all the experiences I'd been through, I'd suffered little permanent physical damage. M mental damage, on the other hand, was possibly extreme, maybe. I say maybe because I think I was beginning to understand this incredible man and his, his wisdom, if one can even say that Mr. Dobbs can be understood, at least with our stunted minds. 
Instead of the expected whorehouse, we drove to a large modern factory that was at least in sight of Cape Canaveral. Bob said that it was one of his uh, disembodiment stations and that he had to go number three. I assumed that he meant he needed to defecate but was drunk and misspoke. The factory, Bob told me, made a substance called dumbass putty. The substance they produced worked in the same way as the child's plaything, silly putty, but was an utter failure. Bob told me, because of the extreme toxicity of the materials used, but I also assume because of its name. And Mr. Dobbs did not lament the ongoing failure. In fact, he shrugged it off, saying something about a few less pinks, uh, possible good mutations, and a huge tax write-off. This man is sinister, but this man may be our only hope. I shall explain why later in the report. For a toy factory, it had better security than I had seen even at our Base X. Not only were there 20-foot concrete walls topped with embedded glass and razor wire, there were guard posts every five feet or so, uh, so that the guards could pass notes and pipes back and forth. Even Bob was ID'd at the entrance, which was more like the heavy gates that lead into a castle than anything. He even had a moat around it with what looked like alligators. They, I eventually learned, turned out to be alligator people, the cast-offs from one of Bobco's genetic enhancement laboratories. This factory was like none I had ever seen. Sure, there were huge machines pushing out some putty-like substance into large vats that oddly had stenciled on them the words tuna surprise and come to think of it the food canning part of the factory had machines with the same titles stenciled on them however i was shocked when bob led me into a room the size of an aircraft carrier that was filled with the most advanced computers i had ever seen there were hundreds if not thousands of nancy reagan knee davis uh, lookalikes pushing punch cards into the slots Bob and I walked through the cavernous affair, me with my mouth agape and Bob with his typical grin. That is, until he slapped one of the Nancy Reagan women on the behind. His hand bounced back, wrapped around his midsection as if it were made of rubber, and smacked him on the back of the head. He glared at the woman and coughed as a key then shot out of his mouth. He rubbed the back of his head as he picked it up, telling me, Number 807 is a feisty one. Hmm, I thought I'd lost this key. It was the same key he used to unlock his office door. This time, his office, in contrast to the other one I saw, was well-appointed and typical for a powerful executive. Bob sat himself down behind a large desk and gathered up huge, neatly piled stacks of paper. He then very deliberately laid them on the floor in two piles. One pile he dove into and rolled around in vigorously. When he got up, he smoothed his suit, breathing heavily. He told me that those particular contracts would be signed. They, whoever they were, could no longer refuse them. Then he got on all fours and snuffled around the other pile like a hound dog. Using his tongue, he pulled out a few sheets, undid the zipper on his pants, lifted a leg, and urinated on them. These were the ones he told me that he had just signed. Sure enough, as if an invisible ink were revealed, uh, the name J.R. Bob Dobbs, Esquire, slowly appeared on the papers, albeit in thick, childlike handwriting. Bob, exhausted, then lay down to take a nap, but first making sure that he had securely locked me into the room. I could not be sure at first if he were exactly asleep, for he lay down with his arms to his side, stiff as a board, like a corpse. I was sure he was trying to fool me somehow. It wasn't until he started passing gas like a snorer would snore that I took the opportunity to search the room. The papers, I dared not touch the befouled ones, were standard contracts, though some seemed to speak of deals for human flesh, human souls, and unimaginably vast amounts of money. His desk, however, was filled with 
cotter pins, broken pens, and jars of urine. I'm sure it was urine, for each one was labeled P.E., uh, with a date and, and the initials J.R., and a, a little note, like, good vintage, a little salty, though, it removes a soles, bad day, and so on. One drawer was entirely filled with money clips. The one below it was filled with severed and dried human hands. I reeled in fear, for at that exact moment, Bob, still mumbling loudly in his sleep, said, You're next, boy. Forgetting that I had long lost the trousers of my own, I reached into the pockets of the filthy overalls and pulled out a diamond-encrusted money clip that contained hundreds of dollars. I backed up against the wall as Bob came toward me with glowing red eyes that seemed filled not with greed, but an animal-like lust, his ever-present grin wider, bigger, scarier than ever. He pinned me there. His breath smelled like a mix between fresh paint and garlic. His breathing was heavy, frightening. He took one hand down and slipped the money clip from my limp fingers, saying, This is mine. I gave the haircut. This was the first time that I was truly afraid of what Mr. Dobbs might do to me. Even though he grinned, his lifeless eyes, or maybe eyes too full of life, spoke of some abyss, of some thing that I could never understand. He then brought his pipe-filled lips next to my ear. The sizzling of the tobacco in it sounded like bacon, but smelled like some used diaper that had been forgotten in a defunct rubber factory. The vomit rose in my throat. He whispered, telling me to look in the forbidden drawer. Having no idea what drawer that would be, I pulled a drawer out of a file cabinet adjacent to myself. My hand rummaged around in it while my eyes were fixed to his. I pulled out a stack of papers and pulled them close to me. Every sheet had a few typewritten lines on them. I tried to focus on them. To, to my relief, they were all bad, very bad, one-liner jokes that you hear at cheap burlesque houses. Bob glared at me, his grin becoming sinister, or should I say more sinister. Yet, I must admit, his gaze was hypnotizing. This was the first time I dared look so deeply into his eyes. Relief only came when he loosened his grip, chuckled, and said, if I remember correctly, Seen my secret stash? Head didn't explode. Passed the test. I leaned more relaxed against the wall, sweating profusely. Bob rhythmically nodded his head as if to some tune that only he could hear. Now ye shallest gazest, uponest the timelessest, ofest the mostest, gruesomestest of horrorsesses. Again he tried and failed to sound biblical, yet now I wondered that if truly the ancients in the good book did not speak with an affected drawl. This Bob was obviously not of our realm as we know it, or he may just simply be semi-retarded and very, very lucky. He ushered me into a room filled with junk that he called Bull Dada. I assume, what with all the Bobco pills that he'd been popping, that he meant Dada art. Seriously, it was junk. Odd balls of carefully wound, used, and dirty string. A newspaper and magazine clippings of male models. Oddly, they all looked like Bob. Poorly painted monster movie plastic models and greenish stone figurines of strange-looking sea creatures. Mr. Dobbs put his hand on my shoulder and gestured wildly with his other hand as if I should appreciate some great treasure of art. I still don't understand his pride with that room of junk, nor what I should greatly fearest about it all. It's still a mystery to me. It was apparently time to go, for Bob, after wiping a tear from his eye, said, I must attend to bidness, as he guided me down a long, fluorescent-lit hallway. It was then that I noticed, in my sobriety, that he seemed to be floating a fraction of an inch off the ground. That would explain the lack of dirt that ever sullied his person, but it may also explain 
his luck. I think he is too stupid to recognize his own mortality, let alone the fact that he's walking and that gravity matters, uh, so that just like the leader of that Russian pre-Soviet spiritual movement, Bulativism, Bob just breezes through the act of living, never worrying or contemplating his next or any next movement, because he may be too mentally retarded to even understand in the basic way that rules apply. We came to a door that had the words janitor place crudely painted on it. I sighed, thinking it was just another of Bob's ruses to get me alone again, However, when he opened the door, I was nearly blinded by the bright lights. It was no janitor closet. It opened to a huge research center that would put our efforts to great shame. There were hundreds of men, women, and things in white lab coats, all scratching away at chalkboards, squinting over slide rules, arguing, generally looking like brilliant scientists. I have little understanding of zero-gravity physics, but from what I saw of our quick walkthrough, these people and things were onto something big. Bob seemed very unimpressed. In fact, he pushed me along saying, I really, really need to go number three. We made it to a sealed doorway. Bob pushed aside a few feeble grays as he inserted his head inside a vertical toilet looking device. He groaned with pleasure as he turned the pages of a cheap monster movie magazine with his toes. I repeat, I do not know what he did with his head in that device, but I do know that he said, taking a number three is better than Pesex. Mr. Dobbs seemed much relieved after taking this number three. He had more of his trademark relaxed self about him. He even gave me back the money clip, uh, without the diamonds and cash, and patted me on the shoulder like a benevolent father. The clip did contain a piece of paper that, in his childish scrawl, said, I owe you stuff. This incredible factory seemed to have no end. We wandered for miles, it would seem, with Bob either admiring his image that shone from his highly polished shoes, or flipping a quarter that always landed on its edge, which he seemed a little ticked off about. Bob nonchalantly opened a regular-looking steel door that led into a huge playground-like room filled with primates. These were no ordinary primates. They all wore lab coats, business suits, party dresses. Some even dressed like Harlem hep cat pimps. All these primates were most definitely busy at work of all sorts. Equations were being written on blackboards. Martinis were being deftly made by the females of the group. The business ones were hunched. Brows knotted with stress over little desks, scribbling away with fountain pens. However, every once in a while, they would all drop their stumpy trousers, defecate, and throw the feces at one another, shrieking high-pitched screams. Bob said that he'd like to come here to relax, especially after doing a number three. They know exactly what they do. Bob made a gesture, all too real with sound effects of defecating and throwing feces. I likes it, he declared. His grin got wider as he too jumped up and down like the primates, mimicking their movements and voices. He bounded around the large room amongst them, in essence becoming one of them. And yes, he did defecate and throw his feces around. But, but... It made sense. After all the monkey business, as Bob called it, he was in a much better mood. I suppose all that man needs is to take a number three and fling a bit of feces around to, quote, even his keel. His grin was radiant as we walked out into that hot, humid night. We tarried around his car for a few minutes. They were the most relaxed moments that I'd had with Mr. Dobbs up to this point. I offhandedly asked him for a cigarette, and though I had never seen him smoke anything but his infernal pipe, he pulled a pack of my favorite brand of smokes, Old Tar Lung, from his jacket pocket. It was a needed smoke, one that I had not had since I got rotated back from Korea in 52. 
Bob smiled at my obvious joy, telling me, those coffin nails sure make a tasty cancer in you pinks. Spread it on my fresh sliced human pain toast every morning. Bob then hopped, like a drunken rabbit, into the driver's side of the vehicle and shouted to me that, now we're gonna have some real good fun, boy. Get in, now! He then let out the most outrageously poor simulation of a rebel yell that I have ever heard. It sounded more like the mating calls of those great apes that reside in the deepest, darkest Congo. It reverberated through the thick night air. I think I may have heard a call in response, but it could just have been a drunken redneck. We sped off down a semi-hidden dirt road that ran behind his toy and tuna factory genetic aerospace research center. The vines and leaves hung low as we whipped down this lane, so low and sharp that my face quickly became a mass of scratches. Bob would occasionally look over at me and leer, telling me in an oily voice that you're looking sweeter by the minute. My heart was in my throat, not only because of the insane driving, but I also feared that Bob might have other, more perverted plans for me. This seemed too painfully real of a possibility for me, for to me, for Bob started to sniff the air lustfully and play pocket pool again, and vigorously. After a few tense moments for me, Mr. Dobbs was cool as a perverted cucumber the whole time, we finally slid to a halt in front of what I can only describe as the most stinking, run-down, decrepit roadhouse that ever sat in the middle of nowhere. It was a truly ramshackle affair. Half of the neon signs only had a letter or two lit up. There was a huge pile of smelly trash out front. I discerned humanoid skulls in the pile. And the peeling paint said it all with the structure's sign dangling off to one side. Ye olde exist bar and grilly. If the outside was a shambles, then the inside was worse. It smelled like a cheap brewery that had been forgotten in an open sewer since the reign of Asher Nasselpol II. I wondered why the hell Bob, a man of such wealth who could easily afford to go to any of the finest clubs in Florida, would take me here. It then occurred to me that this may just be the whorehouse. When we walked in the joint, the place erupted with drunken shouts of Bob, and for some reason, Jar. I stood amazed, for the clientele was astounding by anybody's standard. I saw John Birch passionately kissing Mousy Tongue in one corner, our vice president rubbing the crotch of the preserved corpse of Stalin while drunkenly shouting about damn pinko faggots. Emma Goldman's disembodied head screaming the international. M blanked out, M blanked out stabbing, I was later to learn, our actual non-clone president in the right eye with a fork while Frank Sinatra groveled at her feet. There were also, and the rest of the pages blanked out, and the young folk singer Bob Dylan. Richard Attenborough was filming it all. The worst part, however, were the whores in the joint. Grays, greens, mauves, reptilians, anti-reptilians, them, and ones that I did not recognize. They were all gaudily dressed as housewives, construction workers, maids, businessmen, house painters, bee girls, dead astronauts. The list goes on and all had horribly cheap bouffant wigs on. Bob handed me a jar of yellowish fluid and a handful of pills, telling me that he would soon be back. He took a dozen of the whores up with him, winking sickeningly at me. I swallowed the pills dry. When Bob eventually made it back down to the bar where I'd seated myself, sipping a cheap beer, his face was all aglow. Literally, it shone green, then red. One of those gray creatures was behind the bar, pouring a jelly jar full of vodka for Premier Khrushchev. Bob sat down between us. He still had a satisfied grin on his face that smacked of unknowable pleasures. Bob suggested that we have a drinking contest. The pills were really kicking in at this point, so I found it hard to believe my eyes, but even harder to deny what I was actually seeing. 
This is our place, the real place where things get done, he whispered to me. Then, speaking directly to the premier of the Soviet Union, he said, So, Nicky, think you can drink me under the table tonight, eh? Khrushchev looked at Bob straight in the eye, something I've seen very few attempt. Yes, Mr. Lubes, I drink until you, how you say, blow O-ring. <laughs> the Grey then passed Bob, Khrushchev, and I a full jelly jar each of vodka. Both Khrushchev and Bob down theirs, I was halfway through mine, had to run outside to vomit. I swear it was paint thinner. The label on the bottle had paint thinner crossed out and vodka written underneath. My original guess of it being moonshine was awfully wrong. When I stumbled back in, bleary-eyed, I bumped into no less than Richard M. Nixon. Even if my eyes were blurred, I could not mistake his voice. He cursed me as he chased a small dog around. I made my weaving way back up to the bar where Bob and Nicky were now glaring and laughing manically at each other while pounding their shoes on the bar top. It would seem that Bob had won the paint thinner drinking contest. For as I sat down on my stool, Khrushchev's eyes rolled to the back of his head and he fell off his bar stool onto the sodden floor and into oblivion. I was horrified and asked Bob if he were all right, for this could be a potentially world destructive event. Mr. Dobbs told me, he's fine, the little tyke. He'll be ready for another one in the morning. But first, young agent, let us have a snack. I feared that suggestion of food, for my stomach was still in knots from being sick. But Bob nonetheless led me to a long table covered with all manner of edibles, if you dare call them that. There was a bucket of small red colored balls of a gelatinous material that Bob told me were prairie squid caviar. I had to run back outside to get sick again. It smelled like rotten fish bait. Bob seemed to relish them, for he ate a whole large bucket full with his grimy hands. He let out a belch and for some reason rubbed his backside. I vomited harder at that stench. When I made it back inside, worse for wear, Bob told me he wanted to try my luck out at one of the many card tables. The rest of the evening was a horrible blur, for not only did he force feed me pills, but he kept buying round after round of the local actual moonshine, thank God. Mr. Dobbs could hold his liquor well, though he did seem to flicker bodily on and off like a broken television, especially when he did poorly at the games of chance. At one point, we, uh, Bob, Mao, Churchill, a beatnik type, Ed Sullivan, a strange alien-looking creature with the face of a cuttlefish and I were playing some sort of complicated card game where the cards themselves represented different currencies, worlds, and immortal souls. Bob lost the big hand of the night. In a rare fit of anger, he grabbed the cards from the alien and threw them on the floor, cursing, Well, I do believe that I've been cheated. He then grabbed, wrong side up it seemed to me, an IOU written on a bar napkin and squinted his drunken eyes at it, saying, I guess I'll see you in 1998. He slurred under his breath, Ah, screw you, you damn cheating squid. Though it was Bob, I knew who had been the one that was cheating, for he kept, not very slickly, mind you, grabbing cards out of my hand when he claimed he needed them. The whole event, from what I can remember, was pathetic, but what disturbed me the most was one of the cards had a picture of our planet on it, and the alien-looking creature seemed to relish the fact that he had won it. Bob, in a panicked state that I've never seen before, hustled me so violently toward the door that we knocked over Mr. Nixon, who was sitting cross-legged on the floor, grilling skewers of meat over an open fire. He cursed us, mumbling that he got the taste for dog while doing some brain massaging during a trip to North Korea, and how we ruined his meal, though we'd all soon be dancing to his tune. Nixon did, however, hand us a cheaply mimeographed booklet entitled, how to serve man. With that, Mr. Dobbs' face relaxed a little. He nudged me with his elbow, grinning, and saying in a bit of an oily voice, good recipes in this one. He chuckled to himself as we walked out into the misty morning light. I can still hear the dreadful sound and import 
of his index finger tapping hard against that thin manual of evil. Well, young agent, Mr. Dobbs said to me as we got into his car, looks like we have to get you back to Washington. Bob leaned against a large Cadillac and sighed. I wasn't sure how to take this turn in his demeanor. Uh, yes, I had been confused and terrified by his actions, but I'd yet to see him depressed. It frightened me in a way that I could not previously have imagined. Here stood a man, a thing, that exuded all the confidence and power that we as a people not only admire but need if we want to survive this complicated abyss that our species has dug itself. I could only stand still, sick to the stomach, for even though Bob probably is insane, he is our best chance. And after the strangeness and fragile nature of our powers that be that I'd witnessed, I could see that no other human savior could uh, redeem our slack, as Mr. Dobbs was wont to say. I felt like crying for the first time in years, that is, until Mr. Dobbs stunned me again. He suddenly straightened his back and became hyper alert. My sense of danger ignited as I unconsciously reached for the revolver that I would usually carry in a shoulder holster. It of course was not there, Bob had sold it to some street hood in Miami for a half-eaten sandwich, at least that's what he told me. My eyes darted into the still dim woods around us, fearing the worst. When Mr. Dobbs yelled in a high-pitched voice, SHINY! SHINY! and ran to the edge of the dirt parking lot to pick up a small shard of glass. There were hundreds of shards laying around everywhere. He picked it up and purred to himself as if he had found a great treasure. His smile had returned full force. I could only admire and be disgusted with such a man. Our drive back to Washington was fast and insane, of course. Uh, we must have made that drive in record time, for Bob never once slowed down. He breezed through traffic lights, stop signs, over hillbillies, and every time a patrol car pulled up behind us with lights flashing, it would either mysteriously lose power and pull off to the side, or it would suddenly veer off into a direction that Bob happened to be looking, sometimes up or down into the skies or the earth itself. He was still looking for that skunk ape. We only stopped once, and that was to purchase some overripe peaches at a roadside stand in Georgia. These peaches Bob would throw at specific cars that passed us by. I could never figure out the reason, but after he threw one, he would bounce up and down in his seat in an exaggerated glee. As much as I would beg him to stop so that I could use a restroom, Bob would just scowl at me angrily as if I were asking him to do something horrible. I ended up having to go in my overalls. It didn't matter, they stank so badly that no one would have noticed the difference, other than Bob, that is, who would punch me on the shoulder, damn hard too, and yell, I spy with my third nostril excrement, or uh, urine, or weakness, whenever I would make a, a mistake. It was in a small, rather affluent Virginia town, not too far from our capital, that Bob uh, deigned to stop at the safe house that we employ there. As ashamed as I was to enter and see my colleagues while in such a degraded state, I knew that I had to. I was long overdue, at least it seemed that way to me. Once we pulled into the driveway, Bob graciously opened my door and threw me into the lilac bushes that grow out front, and sternly, frighteningly, told me to stay right there. He had to get some stuff, and the party isn't over by a long shot, boy. He then burned rubber, pulling out of the driveway. My first intention was to run into the safe house and clean myself up, but I feared what Bob might do if I did, so I sat in the bushes getting stung in the face by bees until I saw the agents in the house peep through the windows in obvious disapproval. I suppose it was then that I realized I was a slave for Bob. A most horrible feeling, most horrible. 
It was not but a few shameful minutes later that Bob screeched back into the driveway carrying a case of cheap beer and a dirty aluminum bucket of what he called head cheese, even though it looked more like and smelled more like rotten fish bait to me. You beings like this stuff, right? He asked me. I could only nod my head. Bob beckoned me out of the bushes. I stood there in front of him as he flicked a single moat of dust from my overalls. He then looked me over with a discerning eye and nodded in approval, even though I stank and was completely filthy. The key to the safe house, as always, was underneath the welcome mat. I braced myself for all the humiliations that would be heaped upon me once this assignment was over. No one was there to greet me, not surprisingly. Uh, so Bob, as if he knew the place, led me to the upstairs bedroom where we keep our communications office. He banged the bucket of chum down on the desk in front of Agent X. The skinny little bastard almost puked. I doubt he would have survived a weekend with Bob. And Mr. Dobbs then grabbed six of the beers from the case, and as he greasily smiled at all of us, he proceeded to pull down his trousers and pop the cap of each of the six beers with the power of his butt muscles alone. Though I was not astounded, the rest of the pinks, as Bob liked to call folks like that, in, in the room stood aghast in disgust and terror. They all knew the importance of my mission, so when I discreetly nodded to them to dig into the bucket of chum and down the so-called ass beers, as became agent history after that day, they did as told like damn sheep. Agent X, the chubby useless one, stuttered that there had been an awful tragedy and uh, where the hell have you been? Bob's smile disappeared, and in two giant bounds, he leaped over to the man, glaring, Look here, little pink boy! I've been gambling with your future, and I lost that! And I lost a pair of gold cufflinks that Connie's sister gave to me. So what if one of the clones got damaged? So what? We have plenty more, and if you live long enough, you'll be wishing you had pet rats just so you can eat their crap to survive. So don't whine to me, pink boy. Mr. Dobbs then gave the man a gentle kiss on the forehead and winked at me, whispering, We don't need no damn agents. I understood, and as he left the house, I noticed that somehow, as usual, Bob had made off with their wallets. Mr. Dobbs was incredibly serene in light of his last outburst of anger as we drove through the crowded suburban streets and out into the countryside. He seemed to forget everything as fast as it happened, as if he had severe brain damage. He puffed furiously on his pipe, but with that same oblivious grin that he usually wore. I popped a few of his pills that I had left over just to get rid of the shakes. That, plus the beer I had, made the world seem all that much more intense and reasonable. It all started to make much more sense at that point, and the drive through the countryside was lovely until Bob made a serious face again and said that we had best hang low until things blow over. I know the place to go, a little inn I have that I like to call Shamalot. It took us a while to get to this Shamalot, for Mr. Dobbs seemed to always forget where we were driving. He'd stop off at random diners, trinket shops, gas stations, etc., where he would feel impelled to make a sale. Uh, then we would drive back off in the, the direction we'd just come from. Bob always had something in the trunk of his car to sell to these vendors. It was as if he had a second sense for the sale, and that was what guided him. Where we ended up was exactly where he wanted to go in the first place. We did indeed make it eventually to Shamalot. It was simply an underground type bomb shelter that Bob had off the main kitchen in a sprawling hotel complex in rural Virginia. I followed him through the venue. It was a very well appointed hotel, yet the staff seemed lethargic and prone to bumbling and stumbling around. I thought at first that they may have all been overworked or drunk until I noticed that most of them would shamble off into a dark corner and take a puff off a smile pipe every chance they could get. 
The tobacco they smoked smelled very much like Bob's, just not as nauseating. We wended our way through this maze until we got to a heavy steel door on which was messily painted, a la the little rascals, Shem a lot, no pinks a loud. I recognized Bob's childish scrawl and poor spelling. So this, then, would be our safe haven. Shamalot, the place which I expected to look like a typical bomb shelter, was more a mixture of a perverted hip swingers pad, a communication center of the first order, a hillbilly's hovel, and a museum of oddities. There was a large, stuffed, Bigfoot-looking creature standing next to a utilitarian army surplus metal desk. A bloody scimitar was crudely duct-taped to the thing's right hand, and at the bottom of the statue, along with a pile of dusty humanoid skulls, was a plaque that stated J.B. Exlotl Dobbs uh, the 13th, the beaten fist of Jehovah I. I could not tell you if the thing was once a real beast or not, but its furry body sure stank like the frop that Bob always smoked. As I looked over the shelter slash swingers pad of Bob's, mostly to find an alternate escape route, I became aware of the fact that we were not alone, for from a far corner came the sound of shallow, rasping breaths. Even after all the events that I had witnessed, I still held some fear of the unknown in my heart. With trepidation, I slowly walked to the corner where the sounds emanated. There, in an easy chair, illuminated by the dim and wavy light of a lava lamp, sat a grotesque version of what was once probably human. Its face was a sickening parody. It had a permanent sardonic grin, and between its strained lips was a poorly grafted on pipe, much like Bob's. The thing exuded a continuous soft and disgusting chuckle that sounded like the sarcasm of the damned. I found myself backing away, but with a withered hand, the thing beckoned me to it. <laughs> it chuckled, have I got a joke for you? The thing then proceeded to tell a long, rambling, and incoherent joke about a priest, a pink, and a yeti that go to some bar. It made no sense whatsoever, yet the creature kept laughing to itself as it puffed on its pipe. I did not even notice that Bob had come over and was standing next to me until he let out a room-shaking guffaw at what I suppose was the punchline, which went something like humanity popping like a bunch of damn crawfish in a hot skillet. I shook my head and told this thing before me to shut the hell up and that we may be on the brink of atomic war. Mr. Dobbs twisted my ear in a most painful manner and, while patting the thing on its shoulder, said, Fuck them if they can't take a joke. Suddenly, a very real and cold fear gripped my heart. I asked Bob if he knew something I didn't. Did Khrushchev die of alcohol poisoning? Did the commies assassinate our president in retaliation? Were we on the brink of atomic destruction? Bob just played pocket pool and chuckled, Nuclear war is the least of your worries, young agent, at least after last night's card game. It was then that the room suddenly lit up in red lights and a klaxon started to sound. Bob jumped up and down like a child on Christmas Day, yelling, That's Connie calling! That's Connie calling! He skipped, I'm not kidding, skipped over to a video telephonic device. There he sat down, fidgeting on a large leather swivel chair, furiously playing pocket pool. Hi, sweetie spleen, he said to the beautiful image of Connie on the video screen. What are you doing in our Dallas compound? Mr. Dobbs smiled stupidly as Connie said, Well, dearie, I had a little party at the compound last night, and, uh, well, it would seem that I made a little joke with Jackie about pranking the president. You know what a card he is. And it would seem that three of the doctors overheard. Mr. Dobbs just nodded his head, smiling as if he could picture the party in his, quote, mind, unquote. 
Well, this morning those doctors got all drunk up and took some rifles and, well, dearie, it would seem that Dr. Oswald was a tad bit too tipsy and grabbed some real bullets instead of the rubber kind. Connie made a gesture and on the video screen appeared Dr. Oswald, looking sheepish and more than a bit hungover. Sorry, Bob, he said with a hangdog expression on his face, obviously twisting his foot on the floor in shame. Uh, Connie, as a reward, popped a pill in his mouth, which he gobbled down like an obedient dog. It's okay, Dr. Oswald, Bob said. We all make mistakes. Fuck up, man up, man shut the fuck up, uh, is the motto, isn't it? I was shocked again at Bob's levity in situations of danger. Well, fuck us if we can't take a joke. Bob elbowed me so hard in the ribs that I fell over, gasping. Have Connie give you a few more pills and 50 cents to go see a movie. I'll call Johnny Boy and clear the whole thing up. Dr. Oswald nodded obediently and walked away from the screen, grinning like a reprieved man chewing a big mouthful of pills. Look, Connie, Bob said, where is Dr. Ruby? He and the other doctors are down at his strip joint keeping the party going, Connie replied, looking as radiant as ever. Well, do me a favor, honey bunch of synapses, and go down there and tell Dr. Ruby that I have a job for him. I want him to take Dr. Oswald out, Bob said. Will do, Connie chirped as they jiggled their fingers at their throats, making a strange noise, and hung up their video phones. Bob then looked strangely thoughtful for a moment. I guess I should have told Connie that the job was to get Dr. Oswald out of the country for a little bit. Hmm. He then pulled a folder full of photos from the desk drawer and started to meticulously cut and paste Dr. Oswald's head onto various figures, Railroad conductors, nurses, dinosaurs, and figures of men holding rifles with crudely painted signs that said, I did it. He sighed a lot during the process until the sighs became a sort of barking noise, guttural, animalistic. He got up, smoothed the non-existent wrinkles from his trousers right before he pulled them down and sat on a portable chemical toilet. I averted my eyes until Bob yelled, Gaze upon me, little pink! I actually stumbled backwards at the timber of his voice, yet I found myself obeying his command as I dragged a metal folding chair over to him and sat within a few mere inches from him as he did his business, which in itself was odd, for as I gazed upon his face, it turned rather vividly from green to red to blue and back to green again until, with the sound of a million balloons popping simultaneously, what was previously a very serious strained look on his face transformed into the usual moronic and placid visage that I not only would see in person, but in my own mind as well when I closed my eyes. I suspect that I was going insane. Uh, from all the pills and slack, one could only guess. My feeling of insanity was pretty much cemented when Bob picked up a girly pink video phone and called our still-living president. It appeared that the SOB was a dipsomaniac, a whoremonger, and still at that bordello in Florida. A gray with a powder blue bouffant wig came up on screen looking annoyed. It's Huge eyes were clouded over and drunk as it rolled over and got the president on the phone. Our president rubbed his red-rimmed eyes and in an irritated, stuttering voice asked first if Jackie were there. When soothingly reassured by Bob that she was back in Dallas, he calmed down a bit until he was told of all that had transpired in his besotted absence. The president jumped out of bed. He was clothed in a and here it's blanked out, uniform, something uniform. I lost all respect for him at that point, but could only admire his obvious abilities as M blanked out, M blanked out. Some M something, M something. I personally suspect it might be Marilyn Monroe. 
uh, M, uh, as the MM and the bouffanted gray kept adjusting the eye patch, which it would seem covered the damage that MM had done to it the night before with a fork. I listened in as the two of them conversed. Bob kept trying to explain to the whining man that it's all right and that he, I'm not sure who he meant, didn't have to worry and because I've got it all under control. The president threw another fit while Bob explained to him that his trusted man, Dr. Oswald, was the one who drunkenly grabbed the rifle with the real bullets. The president suggested that they dispose of the assassinated clone, and he himself could explain on TV that he was all right and it was just a scratch. Bob snickered, saying that was a grand idea, but obviously no eye patch is going to fool the necessary amount of people when thousands saw half your head being blown off. So just accept the island offer and shut up. Bob rocked back in his swivel chair, a smug look on his face as if he had just untied the Gordian knot. He played pocket pool so hard I could hear the sound of pain. The president glowered thoughtfully for a moment, taking in the import of the situation he found himself in. Okay, master, he said. I'll take the deal. Just tell Jackie that I'm getting stuff done with the Greys at Camp Canaveral and send Dr. Oswald to me. I have a few choice fists to show him. Mr. Dobbs chuckled and mentioned that he already had Dr. Ruby on the job. He is going to take him out of the country. Bob then abruptly hung up the phone. Did I tell Connie the out of the country part? He looked serious for a few moments until the thing in the easy chair started laughing insanely, yelling, when Bob done fucks up, people die. And when Mr. Dobbs starts farting, the world starts. <laughs> I glared at the creature in disgust. How could you joke at this moment? I, I whispered an aside to Bob, asking what manner of foul creature it was that sat in the corner. Bob said loudly, ignoring my attempt at privacy, pointing to the creature and laughing, <laughs> That is a mistake. A genetic mistake like the alligator people you saw in my grand moat of happiness outside the factory. That mistake used to be as pink as you. That was my middle hand man until it decided to retire to a monastery in Tibet with a big bag of my personal stash of frop. The thing we got back from the Yeti monks was no longer human, but also not quite an overman. So I decided to graft that pipe onto its face and make it frop up 24 hours a day just to see what would happen. The young agent, what you see before you is the future of failure. What you see is an over-under man. The thing in the corner puffed its pipe and cackled like a madman. You see, young agent, Bob told me, that I, I now need you as my middle hand man. I pondered the gravity of what he told me as he put some atonal rumba music on the hi-fi and walked over to the classy bar to fix us a drink. He did a poor job of hiding the spiking of my drink with pills though he obviously tried to look innocent and hide his actions. My heart dropped as he started to subtly gyrate his hips, hula style, when he glided over with my drink. We were alone, and I had no escape. I feared the worst, but knew that this was my duty. Bob handed me the drink and suddenly got serious, if you can ever call him that. He heartily whiffed the stuffy air that hung leaden in the shelter. He told me not to worry too much, that he'd find a way to make a buck out of the whole thing. Without thinking, I drank the cocktail down. The room spun in a pleasant way, and I noticed that the little umbrella that he had put into the drink was topped off with a small plastic bobbly head of the president. The head had what looked like two bullet holes in it. I knew then that God help us if we cannot get this man squarely on our side. Bob gyrated around me while my sight dimmed into a fearful tunnel and my mind reeled at the import of this man's powers. Bob stood over me as I slumped in the chair. Boy, I have plans for you. You're going to Dobstown for further instruction and a little itty bitty operation to open up that 
other hole. I felt the room whirl as all faded out but his pipe, his grin, and that insufferable soft chuckling.